Above all power, above all key, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonder the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of to the Gospel of John and the ninth chapter, John chapter 9. We are very uh, grateful, of course, to have uh, Jim's brothers and sisters visiting with us and also 
uh, my nephew, Jonathan, Brianna's cousin. So uh, I'd like to welcome you guys to our services here this morning. It is great to see you. And uh, listen, if you got John 9 in your hand, this is a, a wonderful little chapter in the Gospel of John. It tells the story of a man who was born blind. Okay, so that implies that he was born with, uh, you know, something organically wrong with his eyes that he could not possibly see. And uh, he has an encounter in this story with the Lord Jesus Christ who was able to, uh, you know, heal him and give him back his sight. Now, you know, the story, of course, it's, it's purely physical. The man is physically blind, and he's giving back his physical eyesight. But, you know, this man isn't really named. It's not like blind Bartimaeus that we know particularly his name. And the reason why, I believe, is because this is a man that represents us all. You know, he was born blind. And did you know that spiritually, that is the condition of every human being born into this world? That spiritually, we are born in a state of sin and alienation from God. Spiritually, man is born into this world blind. And yet, by a touch, an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, by believing in him, we can receive our sight. Now, you know, it's very interesting, but what happens when this whole thing happens? We find that there's a division amongst the people. There are some of them that they're all bent out of shape because Christ had done these things. He did this healing on the Sabbath day. And they can't square that with the letter of Moses' law, so they're all beefing about it. Well, he can't be of God. He's, look at what he's doing. He's violating the Sabbath. How could he possibly be of God? And others, they're looking more you know, directly at the fact that this is a miracle. I mean, this is extraordinary. Who has ever heard that someone that was born blind has suddenly been given his eyesight back? This doesn't sound like somebody that was not sent of God. And so they're, they're, and this is the way Jesus Christ is in the world, you know. He's kind of like a wedge, you know. And that, that question, what do you think of Christ? Jesus asked that question. He thought, what think ye of Christ? And we find that men, they have to, you can't stay neutral towards the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to resolve in your mind what you're going to believe to be true about him. And when you begin to believe what is true about him, Jesus Christ, and you commit to a belief regarding him, you find that it has implications. And just like the, the thin edge of the wedge actually begins to build, so more and more as you tease out all the implications of what is found in the real personage of Jesus Christ, what he came into this world to do, that there is an honest-to-goodness cleavage where Jesus Christ splits human history or human society, all of mankind, in two, depending upon their reaction to him. And we kind of like see this here. And we're going to find out that believing on Jesus as the Son of God opens eyes. If a man will believe in Jesus Christ, his eyes spiritually will be opened. I want us to begin reading at verse number 24. Then, again, they called the man that was blind. This is all after that, uh, that miracle took place, and, you know, the division is ensued. And the Pharisees are uptight, and others are marveling. And so we have here about a reference to the Pharisees that they, again, for the second time, they called the man that was blind, and they said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And he... I love this guy. He's so simple. He says, well, whether he's a sinner or no, that I don't know. But one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. I physically could not see my hand in front of my face. Not a photon of light could impinge my eye in such a way as to give vision and illumination as to anything in the world. And suddenly and miraculously, this guy tells me to do something. He says, well, he, he spit on the ground. You imagine this. He spit on the ground. He takes holy spit. And he turns it into clay, and he kind of smears and anoints the eyes of the blind man. Now, this is he whom in the beginning formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. And then, 
put his, his, you know, that's who Jesus Christ is. And that's what we're learning when we get this story. He tells him, he says, all right, buddy, you just go and you wash your eyes out. You wash the clay out of your eyes. Adam was made out of earth, out of clay. He put something in his eyes, other, yeah, he put clay in there. He put mud in his eyes. But when the guy came and he washed, he went to the pool of Siloam and he washed. It's like his eyes were remade. Who does that? He says, I don't know. Okay, okay. Uh, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know that. But I know this much. I know one thing. He healed me. How do you explain that? And so they said unto him, verse 20, again, again, for the second time, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he said, I already told you once and you did not hear. Why would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? And the Jews, they reviled him and they said, you are his disciple, but we, we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke unto Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't know from where he is. And the man answered and said unto them, well, herein is a marvelous thing that you don't know from where he is, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And then the Jews, they answered him and said, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? You're going to lecture us? They cast him out. They didn't even want to hear what this man and his humble simplicity had to say, and yet we see truckloads of wisdom coming out of this man's heart if they would but listen to it. Now, look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he found him, he went out and looked for this guy. He said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Well, who is he, Lord, that I might believe? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. You know, if you begin to believe on Jesus Christ, you got to start worshiping Jesus Christ. You, you can't, like, believe in him and that he is the Son of God and not logically go forward to worship the man that you now believe in because he's standing there able to take clay and, and, and remake a person's eyes. I mean, this is no ordinary man. And Jesus said this. He said to him, he said, you know, for judgment, I am come into this world. That they which see not might see, might receive sight. That there's a class of people out there, they're in blindness and they're in ignorance and they're in superstition. And I've come to give them light, to open their blind eyes that they may see. That's what I've come to do. But he said also, I'm a double-edged sword. He said also that they which do see might be made blind. He said, there's others that are full of their own knowledge of what they believe they understand. And they've seen maybe some things and yet they haven't seen all that they ought to do and they don't practice half of what they've seen. And there are those that believe falsely. And he said, these I have come to blind. And it was a clear reference to the very dichotomy or division that we saw that was already enacted in society. He was confessing to doing what they said. When when, when it says over and over in John's gospel, and there was division among the people because of him, Jesus Christ said, don't think that I came to send just peace on the earth. Yes, he came to send peace and to bring the love of God and the forgiveness of God. He also came to put an ultimatum in his own person before mankind. He said, I came to bring a sword. A sort of division. That's what a sword does, you know. It divides. That wedge comes down and people face Jesus Christ. And and the question is, dost thou believe in the Son of God? And you're either going to believe in Jesus Christ and all that is entailed in his profession as the Son of God, or you are not. And depending on how you answer that first and primary question, 
a big long train of associated ideas and doctrines are going to be called into are going to be called into question. So you're going to wind up confirmed to one kind of worldview, like a secular or a humanistic worldview, or some kind of a competitive worldview, or else you're going to fall in line with what the God, the Word of God says. And the Holy Spirit will teach you this whole system of theology and belief that unpacks logically out of Jesus Christ. You follow what I'm saying? This question is the question of all questions. It's the first. When a man settles the question in his heart, do you believe in the Son of God? He is, he's really settling something that is very, very major and important. Now, so here's what I want to do. I want to give you just a couple of things about believing on Jesus Christ and, and how that will open up your eyes. First of all, let me say this. That believing on Jesus means that your eyes are opened to who and what he is. This is the first step. This would be the thinnest edge of that wedge I'm talking about. All of a sudden, if you're really going to believe on him, then I guess you got to kind of like know who and what he is and accept that truth, the, the God-inspired truth about him. So you'll notice that Christ does not ask this man, do you believe in me? I mean, just suppose, let's, let's rewrite the scripture, not that we really want to rewrite it, but just for argument's sake, suppose that Christ had actually come up to the guy and said, he found him, he said, hey, hey, remember me? He said, do you believe in me? What do you think the guy would have said? He, said, he would have said, well, of course I believe in you. Of course I believe in you. I mean, you're that guy, aren't you? I recognize your voice. I had mud in my eyes, I couldn't see, but I recognize your voice. You're the guy that, that gave a sight to my blind eyes. How could I not believe in you? But then he might have walked away none the wiser for who Jesus Christ actually is. So Jesus did not ask him that question. He asked a question deliberately designed to set the man thinking, to provoke him to deeper thought. He says, dost thou believe in the Son of God? Now, all of a sudden, the guy says, the Son of God. Well, the first question that comes to him is, well, who is the Son of God? You know, well, who is he? I mean, uh, you're recommending him. He must be. I know you're somebody special. Who is the son of God? And then there's all these other questions. What does that mean, the son of God? And how did God's son happen to be in man's neighborhood? For, for what purpose? And what exactly is implied and meant in being the son of God? And for what purpose? Oh, there's all kinds of associated questions that begin with soon as you Except that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's what he said. He said, uh, he said I'm, I'm the Son of God. I'm the Son of God, okay? The one that you've been talking to, the one you are now looking upon with brand new eyes, I am the Son of God. Do you believe that? Now, that guy cast a verdict in that moment. He did so in his heart, and he believed. And you know what happened to him? He began to grow. In his faith, that if you follow him throughout the length and course of his life, the Bible tells us no more about him other than this. Like I say, I believe that he's really meant to be a generic man, and that's why his name is not given. We are all born in a state of spiritual blindness. We all must encounter the Savior, and we all must begin at the very same place and point. We all must begin by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And if we get that one thing, this this one thing, if we can know it, so much else is entailed in it that we will begin to grow in our understanding and we will become confirmed in a view of the world that is distinctly biblical, that is Christian. Now, let me just give you some examples of how this, this, this must be. Um, the accepted, if this man if he's growing as a Christian in time, there's certain things that he's going to have to come to accept. He's already said, okay, okay, I, I've encountered you. You are awesome. You do what no other man can do. You're the son of God. Well, you know, eventually he's going to have to accept the doctrine of the virgin birth. Because if God has a son, if there is a being that is 100% God and 100% man, how did he get into the world? The, the doctrine of the virgin birth is how we accept that. And you know what? I have no doubt whatsoever that this man came to understand and accept the fact that God, according to his own Old Testament promises, 
the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, in due time, the Mary is the handmaiden of God was chosen. The power of the highest overshadowed her and overshadowed her. And what was born of her was indeed the offspring of the living God, fully divine and yet fully human. He, in himself, he was a miracle. I mean, how can you not believe in miracles? You say, well, yeah, I believe Jesus must have been the Son of God, but I don't believe all those miracles in the Bible. Well, isn't Jesus Christ himself the biggest miracle of all? How can you say, I believe in the Son of God, but I don't believe in the supernatural? Wasn't the very fact that God penetrated the world of man to give his son, wasn't that God actually doing a supernatural act of intervention in human history? Wasn't that God, not like the deist would say, you know, indifferent to the plight of men, but actually interested in us and working a plan to bring himself into our midst in a, such a representation that we can get to know God better. You'll never be able to get to know God any better than you will by studying the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, you know what, we know about things by, you know, the things that we can understand. I'm a man. You are men and women. We look around and we see other men and women. And we can identify them be, with them because that's what they are. Now, how are we going to identify with God? We're not him. So he said, well, I'm going to step down. I'm going to condescend in love to identify myself with them, not only to take their punishment, but to reveal what I'm actually like to them. Uh, and these things are things that he's going to have to come to believe. He's going to have to believe that Christ is a promised Messiah and that God does have an eternal purpose on the earth. A whole system of theology begins to come out. If you'll look there at, uh, back at John chapter 9, verse 5, look at something. Jesus says something very interesting. He's talking to his disciples at this point, and he says, he says to him, he says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, right? As long, but you know something? He says things like that in many places in, in, the, in the New Testament. But you know what? You must have light in your eyes in order to see. If you don't have light, if you're engulfed in darkness, there's no vision. So Jesus Christ, when he says, I am the light of the world, He's not talking about something as mundane as physical sunlight that comes from a bulb or the sun or the stars. He's talking about something so much more vital, an internal spiritual light. He is the light of truth. He is the light of God's reality. He is a light which if a man is faced with that, all of a sudden he can see the way things really are. He is talking about the opening of the inner eye, the opening of the eye of the mind so that we can see truth. And he says, you know what? As long as I am in the world, I am the reference point. I am the focus point. I am he to whom all men must look if they would see the truth. It begins with me. It doesn't end there. Right now, did you know that as a Christian, you are part of the body of Christ on earth in this day? He said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Right? He said to the Jews, he said, I am the light of the world. Whosoever follows me shall not walk in darkness. They'll have the light of life. And then he left. And you know what he said about those days? He said, you are the light of the world. That's what he said. You are the light of the world, and you're not supposed to hide yourself under a bushel basket. Like we were just singing, you're supposed to let your shine, light shine. It's the light of Jesus Christ, because today... He is ascended into glory, and his body on earth through whom his glory shines is what? It's you and I. We have that privilege. Now, if you'll look a little bit later in John, I want to show you something in John chapter 12. There is a struggle to believe some of these things. John chapter 12 and verse number 35. Jesus Christ, you know, he, he said to them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk. While you have the light, that is to say, take steps of obedience in what I'm telling you. Walk in the light, embrace the light, accept the truth, right? Lest darkness come upon you, for he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have the light, believe in the light. While I am with you, believe in me, that you may be my children, you may be children of light, right? And all of that was contingent upon their believing on him. In verse 37, it said that there were some that believed not on his name. 
Look at verse number 46. So verse 46 really nails it. He says this, red letters, Christ uh, stating this. He says, I am come a light, right? A light of truth, a light of understanding. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And that's why he said, he said, uh, the guy had already received physical eyesight, so he no longer was in physical darkness. And then he stands in front of the guy and he says, dost thou believe in the Son of God? He said, well, who is he? He said, it's me. He said, Lord, I believe. And at that moment, he became born again. At that moment, spiritual eyesight began. He opened his newborn eyes to begin to see a whole world of truth, which as he grew as a child of God, he would see more and more and more of it because so much unpacks out of it. Let me quickly just turn you to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I, you know, this is a thick, thick theme in the Word of God. We understand it's important by how often it's treated, so in John chapter 6, look at verse number 35. <clears throat> Jesus said unto him, them, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. Right here he's saying that by believing on me by believing on me you'll have your very deepest needs met you believe on me and your deepest of needs will be met i have that power i know what's in the depths of your soul and i can meet your very need now look over there at verse number 40 he says and this is the will of him that sent me that of everyone which sees the son and believes on him that he may have everlasting life that is so simple let me put it to you this way. You can't possibly miss this. Belief on the Lord Jesus Christ is the entrance or the doorway to eternal life. If you, and that's, isn't that what it said in uh, Acts 16, 31? Uh, the Philippian jailer comes out. He falls on his knees. He's in a state of conviction. He's seen this miracle. He's, whoa, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas, they said, well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on him and you shall be saved. Isn't that what Jesus Christ himself said right there? I am come a light into this world, the truth of God, so that whoever believes in me, they'll have everlasting life. They'll be saved forever and ever. Now, let me point out something else. That believing on Jesus Christ means that your eyes must be opened to what you are. It begins, we understand the truth about him, but the truth about who he is and what he is, suddenly that impacts in our understanding in such a way that we have to face a certain truth about what we are and who we are. We, we say Jesus Christ is a savior, well, if he's a savior and we believe that, doesn't that sort of logically imply that we need to be saved? We say that Jesus Christ is the sin bearer, that when he went to Calvary's cross, when he swept blood in Gethsemane, that was an atonement for sin that we made. How, therefore, can we say that we are not sinners? All of a sudden, in facing the reality of what Jesus Christ is, who, where he came from, and why he came, we are forced into a an acceptance of the fact that we are exactly what the Bible makes us out to be. Creatures, yes, originally made in the, in the likeness of God. Creatures that God loves and would redeem. But lost creatures, fallen creatures nonetheless. You see, here's the thing. You can't just take people a slice of Christianity. It doesn't work that way. Christianity, Christianity begins with Christ. That's point number one. And when you accept Christ, that is so profound and so huge that if you are going to consistently hold all the truth about Jesus Christ, it begins to dominate and dictate everything else that you are to believe. Because, you, you know, obviously as creatures, we have, as, as rational creatures, men, women, we have to think in ways that are consistent in ways in which the truth agrees with itself and supports itself. And so we begin with the thought of Jesus Christ, and therefore everything else unpacks out of it in a certain way. Um, let me just read you something really quickly. This was written by a man named James Orr 
in his book, The Christian View of God in the World. And I think it sums up what I'm trying to say here. He says, for those who accept the truth about Christ, a very definite view of things emerges. He who with his whole heart believes in Jesus as the Son of God is thereby committed to much else besides. He is committed to a view of God, to a view of man, to a view of sin, to a view of redemption, to a view of the purpose of God in creation and in history, to a view of human destiny found only in Christianity. And all this forms a Weltanschauung, or Christian view of the world. And you know what? He goes on to point out that between this Christian worldview and the worldview that predominates in, in godless society, there has always been a bitter antagonism. You can't, they're, they're at odds, completely at odds. You can't believe in this world as a Christian and then just sign up for everything else that the Christian, that, uh, you know, the world says is true. We have to begin to make decisions, and the first decision that we have to make if we're going to walk with Christ is who is he? What think ye of Christ? Whose son, you know who asked that? What think ye of Christ? Jesus Christ did. He asked it of the Jews. He was trying to provoke his enemies to Christ. So he asked them a theological question. He comes up to him and he says, Hey, what do you guys, you know, you're teachers of the law. What do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? He was trying to get them to open up their eyes to the idea that he's not an ordinary man, but he was the son ultimately of God. Turn to John chapter 8. Let me just give you another verse of scripture here on the importance of getting this thing settled and getting it right. John chapter 8 and verse number 23. He said unto them, and here, you know, he's, uh, he's talking to his disciples and some others. There's quite a number of people around him at this point. He says to them, you are from beneath, okay? I'm from above, which he literally was. He is God come down out of heaven to inhabit, to incarnate in our world in a human form. But he was, he, he was God before Adam was even created, right? So he says, I, I came down from, the, the, out of, from above. You are of this world, but I'm not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you don't believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. You see all of a sudden how important that is? He says your salvation is necessary in coming to terms with the fact of who and what I am. And not only so, you, can, you, know, you can't deny the fact that you are a sinner. The reason I came into the world was because you were a sinner. I came to bear your sin. I came to save you for your sin. My, the whole purpose of my existence, well, the major purpose of my existence was to, to atone for your sin so that you're going to have life for God and then also in my person to represent unto you everything that God is like so you can see it in a living picture as a human being just like you. These things are important. We have to uh, acknowledge them. And then finally, because we are kind of like running out of time, let me just say this that um, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ leads to open eyes regarding the state of the world in which we live. Um, you know, you, 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 there's, there's so many things that if you're going to believe in Christ, things have to kind of follow. Yeah, have you ever heard that expression, um, being all in for Jesus Christ? You've heard that, being all in for Jesus Christ? It implies a total commitment of your life to him. You know, at the dawn of that man's spiritual history, when he said, oh, this one thing I know, and then he takes Jesus as his savior, he knew one thing. But if you were to catch up with that guy 40 years down the road, and there was a lot of other things that he didn't know. If he, if he didn't yet know that Christ was the only way to heaven, if he didn't know that the Bible is all true, if he didn't know, if he couldn't make up his mind whether or not men were created or evolved, if he couldn't, you know, if he couldn't even determine whether or not uh, gender was biological or by, you know, uh, uh, by some subjective basis, if he couldn't answer fundamental questions that the Bible is very clear about, and then Jesus Christ, we would say about that person, was he ever really truly saved? Or if he, was, if he was saved, he never grew 
in knowledge the way that he ought to have been because, you know, Christ brings the beginning of light and truth, but we are supposed to, to grow in him in a special kind of a way. So there's some things that I just asked you this morning, okay? Um, are you all in for the Lord Jesus Christ? I, I, I know you guys profess to believe that he is the son of God, but, you know, are you growing? In divine knowledge, does, is, is, is everything that you're doing reflect what you ought to be doing as a follower of him? Are you willing and able to stand for what you believe in the world? Even though a lot of what we have to believe as Christians right now, that does kind of put us out of sorts with the world. That we can't be a faithful adherent of the things of Christ and the things of God's word and always be in lockstep with the world. Sometimes there's going to be antagonism. Are we ready to take that step? Um, these are kind of important questions that we want to ponder. And, you know, let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus Christ as you did into our world. We know the purpose for the which you did so, Lord. It was out of love for man and in view of the fact that we have a need that only he could meet. So, Father, we put this question to our own heart. Do we believe that you are, in fact, the son of the living God, that you had an eternal existence, were never created, have always been, and that is part of a plan, a divine plan? You entered into our world on a mission, a mission of love and mercy, and for the which, Lord, we have no other recourse if we would go to heaven, if we would commune with God other than to avail ourselves of what you did. Lord, we put these questions to ourselves. And also, Lord, uh, we look into our own hearts and lives as to whether or not we are fully and consciously, to the extent that we know that we ought, living out all the Christian truth that we are aware of. Help us, Heavenly Father, to make in our own heart, to resolve in our own hearts, Lord, to walk with you as we should. And we'll give you the thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.